Welcome to the third and final episode in a Legendarium series about Aethelstan. In Part 3, Pax Britannica, we will talk about how Aethelstan preserved the peace he created in England with a great victory that would be the crowning achievement of his rule. For all of his successes, Aethelstan's power did not go unchallenged. In the year 934, the rest of North rebelled against the rule of the Southern English, hoping to restore their royal family to their seat of power in York. Aethelstan, like a true imperial lord, raised an army from his English, Celtic, and Viking subjects. After seeking the aid of the northern saints, Aethelstan arrived at the Pictish rock fort of Dunotar. The Scottish armies who came to assist the northern rebels soon surrendered without a fight. Aethelstan forgave the northern lords for their rebellion and restored them to power, and the Pax Britannica remained intact with little bloodshed. His loyal subjects received rewards for their role in the northern campaign, including Aethelstan's royal armor-bearer, Aethelgard, who received sprawling estates in Lincolnshire free from taxation, and after fifty years of high taxes that financed the Viking Wars, tax relief proved welcome indeed. Despite this victory, in the year 937, King Constantine II of Scotland made an alliance with Ogun of Strathclyde and Olaf Guthfridson, the Viking King of Dublin. The Allies then invaded England, hoping for the rest of North to rise in support of them. A fleet of 615 Viking ships sailed from Dublin around the south of England to the River Humber, which served as the border between northern and southern England. There they ravaged lands loyal to Aethelstan, who assembled his imperial army for a second time amidst howling rain and slashing wind. He marched north to meet the Norse Scotty army and fought them at the Battle of Bruna Burr in the year 937, thought to have been one of the bloodiest battles of the age. Five kings and seven earls lost their lives, including Aethelstan's cousins Alfric and Aethelwyn, along with a prominent English bishop who used a club in battle because church law forbade him from shedding blood with a sword. The events of the battle are unclear, but according to one source, the West Saxons mounted a cavalry charge against the enemy. If true, this disproves the popular theory that the Anglo-Saxons only fought on foot and merely rode horses to battle. The Annals of Ulster further record Brun Aber as a great battle, lamentable and terrible, was cruelly fought, in which fell uncounted thousands of the Northmen, and on the other side, a multitude of Saxons fell, but Aethelstan, the king of the Saxons, obtained a great victory. Another Anglo-Saxon source observed in bloody-minded jubilation, the black raven and the brown eagle with white tail shared their feast with the wolf, the grey beast of the forest. Finally, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle recorded the king's resounding victory with a jubilant poem. The hoary man of war had no cause to exult. In the clash of blades, he was shorn of his kinsmen, deprived of friends, on the meeting place of peoples, cut off in strife, and left his son on the place of slaughter, mangled by wounds, young in battle. The grey-haired warrior, old crafty one, had no cause to boast." This battle became one of the most important in the history of the British Isles, as it ensured the new English kingdom would endure in the face of foreign aggression. Later generations of Anglo-Saxons simply remembered it as the Great War. Meanwhile, the Celtic princedoms in Wales and Scotland had no choice but to accept the supremacy of Aethelstan's England. Sadly for the king, he would not live much longer after his titanic victory. 
He died on October 27, 940 at Gloucester, aged 44, after a reign of 15 years. Athelstan chose to be buried at Malmesbury Abbey in Wiltshire, a favorite of his, close to the shrine of St. Aldhelm, in preference to the family mausoleum at Winchester. His body rested there until zealots burned his remains during the Reformation. William of Malmesbury wrote of him 200 years later, the firm opinion is still current among the English that no one more just or learned administered the state. Opinions from his contemporaries proved no less glowing. A Norseman called him the greatest man in the world. A Frank called him the most famous king of his time. In Ireland, a chief described him as the summit of honor. Indeed, the greatest testimony for Athelstan's power and greatness is in the kingdom of England itself. For 50 years after Athelstan's death, it enjoyed a golden age of peace and prosperity that would only be broken by another round of Viking invasions a half century after Athelstan's death. That wraps things up for this Legendarium series. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, press like. If you want to see more, press subscribe. And if you've got anything to say, let me know in the comments section. Thanks again for joining me, and I hope that you have a great rest of the day.